Hello and welcome to Camp Xbox. On November 15, 2001, the original Xbox was launched in North America, entering a sixth generation market alongside the PS2 and just a few days later, the Nintendo GameCube. Sega had left the console market earlier that year, leaving room for the Xbox to establish itself. While I wasn't there on launch day, I can only imagine the excitement surrounding the release of a brand new console with the potential for new franchises. Being the most technically powerful console at the time, and promising online play soon after, the Xbox launch was a significant event. Looking back, it's interesting to reflect on the experience of getting an Xbox at launch, and the best way to do that is by revisiting its launch titles. With a staggering 20 titles available on day one, there were plenty of options for early adopters. I recently played through all of them, and I aimed to catalog them while determining which games offered the best experience for new Xbox owners at the time, and which may have been disappointing. As a note, this is only the North American launch, and only those released on day one, so games like Amped that were released a few days later will not be on the list. But going in alphabetical order, let's dive right in. First up is 4x4 EVO 2, the first of many driving games that launched with the Xbox. This title was initially released on PC just a few months before the Xbox launch. In this game, you have the choice between an array of trucks and 4x4 vehicles, and a large selection of activities to engage in. Whether it's racing or completing various missions, the game is set in expansive areas such as deserts, mountains, and volcanoes, to name a few. For its time, the vast landscapes were the highlight, and on the Xbox, the draw distances are impressive. Unfortunately, this racing game is one of the weaker entries in the launch lineup. While the game offers a variety of activities, its mechanics leave much to be desired. The driving feels loose, and turns take some getting used to. In race mode, especially when dealing with aggressive AI opponents, these issues become apparent. The AI is tough and will challenge you every step of the way. However, the collision mechanics are terrible. Touching other cars don't result in any sort of realistic collision, and it just makes your cars stutter. It creates a slow and challenging recovery. Despite the amount of choices, it falls short of delivering a satisfying racing game experience. While you can get used to the jankiness over time, there are much better racing titles available. 4x4 EVO 2 introduces some diversity with its mission mode, throwing players into a wide open environment with hidden objectives or other small tasks around the area. This mode is fine, but lacks depth. Exploring these environments doesn't provide much enjoyment, as the focus is on the sheer size rather than detailed interesting content. Although not visually impressive, the game's expansive landscapes are noteworthy. Despite the abundance of missions and races, none really stand out. 4x4 EVO 2 appears to prioritize quantity over quality, making it a less appealing day one purchase, especially when compared to some of the other racing games that we're going to talk about later. Next up is Air Force Delta Storm, which was a console exclusive at launch, but later saw a Game Boy Advance version the following year. This game falls into the flight simulator genre, and it's the only one in this initial launch lineup. In Air Force Delta Storm, players take control of various fighter jets and engage in missions. They typically involve the destruction of enemy fighter jets. While this story isn't very compelling, the game exudes an odd, futuristic vibe that adds to its appeal. Visually, the game is impressive, with crisp plane models and outstanding draw distances. The environments, though often barren canyons or seas, are typical of flight games and look good. While I'm not usually big into flight simulation games, I found Air Force Delta Storm to be surprisingly engaging. In the story mode, you navigate a map to reach missions, encountering enemies along the way. This approach adds a light strategy element to the experience, and it's reminiscent of an RPG. The gameplay itself is solid, featuring excellent flight controls. Shooting feels satisfying, and the missile lock-on mechanism is intuitive. While it doesn't revolutionize the flight sim genre, it faithfully replicates the experience on the Xbox. Air Force Delta Storm offers a decent amount of content, providing an enjoyable experience throughout. 
While it lacks a gripping narrative, its solid visuals and engaging gameplay make it a worthwhile choice, especially for flight sim fans who had limited options on the console at the time. While not the best choice of these launch titles, it stands out as a strong outing in the genre and would have been a fun pickup. Arctic Thunder is the next title, a console port of the Midway arcade game with the same name, which also saw release on the PS2. I've previously done an in-depth review of this game, and if you've seen that video, you know I wasn't a big fan of it. In short bursts, like in its arcade cabinet, it's a fine game where you can race downhill tracks, shoot competitors, and perform wacky stunts. However, beyond that initial excitement, the game really doesn't offer much. While there is a small selection of simple tracks available from the start, there are numerous unlockables in the game. The main issue I have is the time it takes to unlock more content. Points earned in races can be used to upgrade vehicles, unlock characters, and access new courses. Unfortunately, the grind to get enough points becomes tedious. Replaying the same limited pool of courses to unlock content just becomes tiring. Arctic Thunder has a zany and fun combat aspect, but the courses lack the strength to encourage repeated play. Graphically, it's not exceptional either, featuring a cartoony and simple style without any standout elements. There are multiplayer modes available, including quick races, but to add variety, you'll want to focus on modes where you earn points for upgrades so you can have more to do. While enjoyable in short arcade bursts, as a major purchase with your console in 2001, Arctic Thunder would have needed a significant upgrade from the arcade version. I do not see it as an essential racing title on the original Xbox, and it likely would have been a disappointment if bought at launch. Cell Damage is a vehicular combat game that often went unnoticed during its launch. Originally released on the Xbox, it later received ports to the GameCube and PS2, as well as an HD remaster in 2014. Cell Damage is an immensely enjoyable vehicle game reminiscent of Twisted Metal, but with an outlandish style. Players wield weapons such as large chainsaws, tommy guns, or giant axes, providing a blast when used to destroy other vehicles. The game moves at a very brisk pace, especially in the normal arena mode where constant deaths and enemy eliminations keep players on their toes as they strive to climb to the top of the leaderboard. Playing with other people is excellent as well in this mode, and is worth trying out with a group of friends. Featuring a bunch of characters, each with a distinctive style that sets it apart in the launch lineup. The game boasts excellent visuals and a captivating art style. Sometimes it's not about the most realistic graphics but a compelling art style that makes a game stand out, and Cell Damage achieves this with flair. It's one of the standout visually appealing games from the launch lineup, and the voice acting adds to the experience, with the voice actors fully embracing the zaniness of these characters. One drawback is the limited options for game modes, with the main one just being the arena fighting mode. However, the relay race, where you have to hit checkpoints in a certain order, all while trying to kill your enemies, adds a worthwhile variation to everything. Content is a little lacking, and I wouldn't consider this a must-buy with your Xbox. Cell damage would have been a great addition to anyone buying the Xbox at launch. Playing this game with friends would likely have been a blast, especially for those who invested in some extra controllers. Dark Summit is the next game on the list, a snowboarding title that precedes the Xbox exclusive Amped only by a few days. Dark Summit takes an unconventional approach to the extreme sports genre that was huge in the early 2000s. It's a downhill snowboarding game where players can grind rails, take huge jumps, and perform various tricks. What sets it apart is the anarchy-inspired story woven into the game. The narrative involves military experiments at a ski resort, with players going undercover to take down the operation. Each slope features specific missions, ranging from racing others to tricking over radioactive goo or even planting bombs. The game showcases a creative variety of missions, and you can sense the developer's effort to make it stand out. While it may not be the most visually impressive game, it consciously attempts to distinguish itself from other titles. The slopes have quirky designs, and the characters exhibit odd proportions, making the game quite memorable to look at. The music is another standout element, featuring an eclectic mix of electronic genres that adds to the overall experience. However, not all missions are equally enjoyable, and some are challenging to a frustrating extent. 
The layout of these levels is a bit peculiar with the long slopes and mission placements on the slopes make it easy to miss objectives on the way down. The controls also require some getting used to. Despite these quirks, anyone who bought it at launch would likely have had fun with its unique and punk-influenced aesthetic. It aligned well with Xbox's marketing around its launch. While Amped, released shortly after, offered a more polished snowboarding experience following the expected Tony Hawk formula, Dark Summit's oddness and ingenuity makes it an interesting addition to the launch titles, even if not among the best. Dead or Alive 3 is the first game on this list that I consider a must-buy among the launch titles. It stands as an incredible 3D fighting game and is exclusive to the Xbox, making it a compelling reason to pick up this console on launch day. One of the game's notable features is its exceptional visual quality. It's one of the best looking original Xbox games, even to this day, and it must have looked amazing at launch. The character models have a fantastic cartoony look, and the dynamic and vibrant environments add to the overall look. The attention to detail in the backgrounds enhances the overall visual style. Beyond its impressive visuals, Dead or Alive 3 offers solid gameplay in the fighting game genre. While I'm not an expert in fighting games, having grown up playing them, I find Dead or Alive 3 to be one of the best 3D fighters available. The animations are smooth, each character boasts an interesting and well-defined moveset, and the overall gameplay feels fluid, seamlessly weaving kicks and punches into solid combos. The countering system works effectively too, contributing to a cohesive and enjoyable fighting game experience. For those seeking an outstanding multiplayer experience, Dead or Alive 3 stands out as one of the best options on the original Xbox. It's an all-around solid package with great music and engaging character plots, even though it might be somewhat light on game modes. However, the game's endless replayability stems from the vast array of characters and their unique moves. As the only fighting game at launch, Dead or Alive 3 remains one of the best on the console, particularly for fans of 3D fighters. For anyone into this genre, Dead or Alive 3 would have been an excellent addition to their Xbox at launch, and it continues to be a strong choice to play on Xbox to this day. Fusion Frenzy might evoke some nostalgic memories for many players. Personally, I have fond memories of the demo from my childhood, but upon revisiting it for a review I did not too long ago, it didn't leave as strong of an impression. It's also good to note that this is an Xbox exclusive launch title. Aesthetically, it stands out on the console with its bright colors and cartoony look. The draw of party games and the promise of multiple mini games designed for four player play likely made it an exciting choice for many. However, I feel that the mini games lack enough variety to sustain extensive playtime. One notable drawback is the repetition of mini games with new skins especially those involving controlling characters and engaging in 3D fighting and platforming spaces, which I found rather bland. For such experiences, alternatives like Power Stone offer a more enjoyable time. Fortunately, there are some standout minigames such as the Sumo minigame where you're in a roll cage trying to knock your enemies out. The physics work well, and this particular minigame is an absolute blast. There are a few others with vehicles that provide a satisfying gameplay experience. However, I feel like the race minigames are somewhat of a cop-out, since it involves racing on one small course, and that's considered a whole minigame. While Fusion Frenzy can be enjoyable in short bursts, or when playing a handful of the minigames, I personally don't believe it represents the best in multiplayer gaming, both during its launch and in the current landscape. I mentioned Dead or Alive 3, which offers a consistently good time, compared to Fusion Frenzy, where the fun is limited to specific minigames. While some people have positive memories of this title, I believe there are better multiplayer games available, especially considering the one coming up next. So we're about halfway through the list, and we've reached the biggest game of them all, the Xbox exclusive Halo Combat Evolved. I wish I could present a hot take or a different perspective on this, but I can't. This game is one of my all-time favorites, the title that introduced me to Xbox, and undoubtedly the best in the launch lineup. Halo stands as one of the finest first-person shooters, a game that not only changed the genre, but continues to offer a fantastic experience every time I revisit it. The environments in each level are not just backgrounds. 
They are striking and memorable. Whether traversing the rolling hills of the second level, Halo, or navigating the dark corridors of the library, each theme leaves a lasting impression with a wealth of variety that keeps the game fresh. The shooting mechanics are simple, but it's the diverse enemies that truly elevate the gameplay. Confronted with a lineup of different Covenant enemies, you must constantly strategize on how to engage and overcome each adversary. It's not just a shooting gallery, each enemy has thought put into it. Combine that with the iconic vehicles like the Banshee, which remains one of my favorite vehicles in gaming history, and you've got an unforgettable, amazing experience. Beyond the exceptional single-player story mode, the multiplayer aspect was a game-changer in 2001. The meticulously designed maps worked seamlessly to create an enjoyable shooting experience. Whether you were engaging in system link battles or just a four-player showdown on one console, Halo was the driving force behind getting an Xbox, and I still consider it an essential video game to play today. With its highly replayable multiplayer, intriguing lore, and excellent shooter gameplay, Halo holds a very special place in my heart. It was an absolute must-buy during its time, and there's not much more I can add to the conversation. So let's go from here and move on to some lesser known launch titles. But before we get into that, first of all, thank you so much for watching this much. It really means a lot to me. If you're enjoying this video so far, be sure to leave a like as it helps me out a lot in the algorithm. But moving on, Mad Dash Racing is another Xbox exclusive racing title in this launch lineup, but it's very different. It shares similarities with Sonic R, where you control both your character and you platform across the racetracks, creating a Saturday morning cartoon version of a racing game. Each character has unique traits that can help them navigate the track faster. You can fly over obstacles, break through objects to create shortcuts for yourself, and aim to reach the goal as quickly as possible. If, like me, you love racing games, Mad Dash Racing offers a distinctive dimension that keeps the experience interesting. While the game doesn't boast an extensive range of modes, the track designs keep things engaging throughout the entire race. Each track features numerous paths and variations for you to explore, allowing you to find the best route. The game even employs some unconventional controls to add spice to the experience. For instance, when you find yourself hanging off of ledges or swimming, you have to move the sticks in a circular motion to maintain speed. It's odd, but I appreciate the unique twists it introduces. Mad Dash Racing does not have a lot of longevity, but I believe it provides a good time for a little bit. Grab another player or two and you'll have a blast racing through these various locales. It's a good time, just not the absolute best, but if you pick this one up on day one, I'd say you would have had a great time with it. Now we're delving into the sports section of this lineup, and the first entry is Madden 2002. It was released on most major consoles at that time. Madden delivers everything you'd expect from a football title of that era. I actually conducted an in-depth review of this one and another football game that we're going to talk about later in this video, and while I found this one not as impressive, it doesn't mean it's a bad football game at all. The visuals are solid, and the gameplay is equally satisfying. If you're well-versed in football games, you'll likely find yourself in very familiar territory here. For those who enjoy running and managing a team, Madden offers season or franchise modes, each providing robust gameplay options. What sets Madden apart is it's a simulation approach. It's a relatively slower paced football game that demands more strategic thinking than an arcade title. Notably, passing is hidden, and it requires you to hit a button to reveal all of the available throwing options when you go to pass. It's these small touches that make Madden more of a simulation approach to a football game than something like NFL Heat. One standout feature of this game is its excellent sound. It features announcers with a great set of dialogue, and it's some of the best that you'll hear in a sports game at that time. Madden 2002 offers a comprehensive football experience, and if you pick this one up on launch day, you're likely a football fan who would have enjoyed this solid football game. However, I believe if you were there on launch day, the other football game coming up later was the better choice to get. Next up is one of two NASCAR titles, and that's NASCAR Heat 2002. 
This was originally released on PS2 and was brought to the Xbox at launch. He is the more simulation oriented of the two, and I've also created a comparison video on this one. I enjoyed it a little less, but again, both are solid choices. NASCAR Heat controls like what you would expect from a racing game. The tracks are usually oval shaped and you race for many laps. It's not my favorite type of racing game, but I do think it has its qualities. The visuals are strong on Heat and the car models stand out. NASCAR Heat excels in game modes with a bunch of challenges to complete on the side. The career mode isn't as strong as NASCAR Thunder, but it's still an enjoyable game and has other things to take care of when you want to hop off career. I love the FMV sequences here between races, it's something you don't see a lot of anymore and I think it adds some fun to the game. The soundtrack to this one is nice and nostalgic, and all of the car sounds are good. It's another game that doesn't have a lot to dig into and is really only going to be for NASCAR fans. If you just like racing games, at launch you probably would have gone for something else and had a better time. As a NASCAR fan though, this would have been fun, but I think the next game would have been the better choice. NASCAR Thunder emerges as the superior NASCAR game between the two. It also saw a PS2 release a month before the Xbox launch. With a more arcade-oriented experience, the controls just feel smoother. The addition of a drafting meter next to your speedometer is a small but impactful detail, providing valuable information about the draft you're getting at any given moment on the racetrack. It contributes to an overall enjoyable driving experience. While Thunder may lack the variety of modes that he offers, its standout feature is the career mode. It drew me in with intricate details and addicting gameplay. The arcade style gameplay makes it an easy pickup and play racer. One small note about this game and kind of an odd complaint is the over-reliance on the song Sweet Home Alabama. I don't really love that song, the repetitive nature of it in every menu becomes tedious and it leads me to muting the game every time I turn it on. Once again, this game is going to cater mainly to NASCAR enthusiasts. For those who picked it up at launch, it stands as the superior NASCAR game, although if you're just in the racers, there's a game much later that's going to be a bit better. NFL Fever 2002 stands out as the premier football game on the original Xbox and remains an Xbox exclusive to this day. When compared to Madden, Fever capitalizes on the Xbox hardware, presenting a stunning title for 2001. The game boasts impressive lighting and player animations that are exceptionally smooth, enhancing the visual appeal of tackles and touchdown passes when viewed through the in-game camera that feels like you're on the football field. The vibrant colors pop, providing a visual experience that differs from a more simulation-focused football game. Opting for an arcadey feel, Fever distinguishes itself, offering smoother player movements and direct, precise passes. Its accessibility makes it enjoyable for those with a basic understanding of football, but also a great time for huge football fans. The addition of a turbo button for blazing down the field adds an extra layer of excitement. In terms of game modes, Fever includes the standard season and franchise modes, catering to those who enjoy deep dives into team management and statistics. Between the two football titles, Fever emerges as the more enjoyable and visually appealing choice on the Xbox. While both Madden and Fever are solid options, NFL Fever would have been the better choice for football fans on launch day. I don't think it's a must-buy for anyone that isn't a fan of sports, but for enthusiasts, NFL Fever was a must-buy at launch. Unlike the last sports titles, there was only one hockey game released on launch day, and that is NHL Hits 2002. This is an arcade-style hockey game made by Midway Games and also saw releases on the GameCube and PS2. Offering a purely arcade experience akin to something like NBA Jam, you get to pick out teams, but you only select three players to have out on the rink at once. Once you're out on the ice, the game is fast-paced, hectic, and fun. Having played only a demo before, now that I've experienced the full game, I believe this is an excellent hockey title. For someone like me who knows absolutely nothing about hockey, it makes it incredibly easy to get into. You simply slap shot and pass, aiming to get the puck right into the goal. 
It's a simple, good time, and I love a sports game that offers such accessibility. I can imagine that this would be a fantastic multiplayer game, becoming extremely competitive because scoring feels like a very close call. It's a challenging game, but manages to stay engaging throughout. NHL Hits 2002 also features a fun fighting system where you can engage in fights with other players, and it's like a light fighting game. Additionally, there are different moves to secure the puck, working in a manner similar to Rock Paper Scissors, which I found really enjoyable. It's an all-around solid hockey game, and a highly addicting one. I'd say even if you weren't a fan of hockey, you'd have a good time here, but for any NHL fan, this was a good pickup at launch. Next up is Oddworld Munch's Odyssey, a 3D platformer that was an Xbox exclusive for this console generation. This title stands out as one of the more interesting entries in the launch lineup as Microsoft managed to include this unique addition from the Oddworld franchise. Similar to its predecessors, this game takes players on a peculiar journey exploring elements of the 3D platforming genre in a new and captivating way. In this installment, you control two protagonists interchangeably, with the goal of rescuing creatures in an overly industrialized world that is wreaking havoc on the environment and creatures. The game features an excellent mix of gorgeous greens and trees juxtaposed against dark gray buildings, creating a visual clash that makes Oddworld stand out. While it might not serve as a graphical showcase per se, the game distinguishes itself with a visually unique style. Personally, I always enjoy more of an art style over hyperrealism, and the designs in Oddworld are indeed excellent and disgusting. The world is thoughtfully crafted to look both intriguing and repulsive. The controls are unconventional as well, combining elements expected from a 3D platformer, but mixed with aspects of lemmings. You control various creatures to solve puzzles across in-game environments, providing a delightful blend of puzzle solving and platforming. This is particularly evident with Munch, who can navigate between swimming and exploring engaging water areas. The game also pushes the Xbox hardware by allowing real-time character swapping in some levels, even if the characters are far apart. Anyone who picked this up at launch would have had a great time, as Oddworld Munch's Odyssey stands out for its uniqueness in the launch lineup. I'd say its length offers players a substantial gaming experience as well. Munch's Odyssey is undoubtedly another gem amongst these launch titles. The next game in the launch lineup is Project Gotham Racing. If you follow this channel, you know I love this Xbox exclusive racing franchise. In my opinion, this is the best racing game in this lineup and one of the best on the console. It offers a simple arcade racing fun time with excellent challenges and loads to do. The handling feels perfect and there's a great selection of cars to choose from. I particularly appreciate this game's unlocking system and overall progression. In each of the modes, you have multiple tiers of difficulty, allowing you to choose which one to tackle based on your preferences. The most interesting part to me is the kudos system where you gain points for driving well. This could mean not hitting walls, drifting, and overtaking racers. You can combo these actions together to achieve better scores and earn higher medals. However, it's not just about racing. There's also fun time trials, modes where you have to combo points while weaving between cones, and overtaking challenges, where the more people you overtake in a race, the better metal you get. It's a challenging game, but each mode is lengthy and addicting enough to keep you coming back. Even if you just want regular racing, you can have that too, and the plain racing mode is also a great time. The game is enhanced by amazing tracks with insane lighting for its time. The reflections are remarkable for 2001. The track layouts in this one are some of my all-time favorites, and even just playing a little means I'm actually going to play all day. At launch, this game, to me, would have been a must-buy. It's an excellent racer and looks gorgeous for its time, and would have offered tons of playtime for any new Xbox adopter, and continued being great even after more than a year after launch. Here's one I discussed not long ago, the Xbox launch exclusive Shrek, which later received a port to the GameCube. Developed by DICE, this 3D platformer left me very unimpressed. First and foremost, the controls feel awkward. Shrek moves extremely fast, 
making it nearly impossible to control him properly, and the camera struggles to keep up. His jumps are unsatisfying, and the signature wall bounce that he has in the game sends you flying erratically and wildly, making the gameplay just feel off. I also find the visual aspect of this game unappealing. While it does have impressive draw distances and is doing some advanced stuff for the time, many areas just feel empty, and the impressive lighting can sometimes be a drawback where deep shadows render parts of the games invisible. The story in concept is interesting, as it doesn't directly tie into the movie, but serves as a continuation of it. However, it's weakly executed. Shrek goes around helping other fairy tale creatures to regain his swamp, and there's very few cutscenes. It kind of robs the game of any real humor that would have continued from the movie. Also, the objectives are repetitively recycled between missions. It's reminiscent of Mario 64, where you enter a world and complete an objective. These objectives can be as mundane as hitting a lamp. It's plain and becomes tedious quickly. Despite my negative take, I do want to acknowledge some positive aspects such as the interesting wall bouncing mechanic. It is a bit funky, but there is potential there for Shrek's mobility. If the camera could keep up, it probably could have been a fun game to play. However, as it stands, the game just falls short. Choosing this game at launch would have been a huge disappointment, especially considering the movie's popularity at the time. It just feels like a missed opportunity for a better gaming experience. We've reached the final racing game of the launch lineup with Test Drive Off-Road Wide Open, and that's a mouthful to say. This racing game is akin to 4x4 Evo from the beginning of the video, but I believe this one is the better off-road title. It's also a port of the PS2 title of the same name, featuring one unique addition with Stadium Races, which are exclusive to the Xbox. The racing in this game leans a bit on the heavy side, but overall it's a simplistic yet enjoyable racing game, offering single races and a career mode. The career mode is likely where you'll spend most of your time, allowing you to travel to various locales, many of which are exotic and fun. Visually, it's a solid looking game with a variety of off-road car models to explore. The diverse locations contribute to the enjoyment, like the Hawaii level that lets you race or plow right through the lava. The game doesn't take itself too seriously, embracing a sense of dumb fun in its racing. Unlike 4x4 where handling can feel too loose, everything here feels tight. The game focuses on driving in wide open areas, and I appreciate the checkpoint system that lets you choose how to reach the next checkpoint in a race, navigating hills or valleys however you choose. An interesting mode is free ride, which allows you to explore the race areas freely. While it's not groundbreaking, it serves as a casual way to blow off some steam and just drive around some mountains. This title doesn't offer a lot of depth because it's a simple racer at its core, and there's nothing wrong with that. I don't consider it a must-buy at launch, but it could be an okay choice for those seeking some off-road action, and it's certainly a better option at launch than 4x4. Moving on to Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X, an Xbox exclusive that I absolutely adore. As a huge Tony Hawk fan, I believe this package, featuring every level from the first two games updated for the Xbox, was the best rendition of these games until recently. The first two games, especially the second, boast some of the best levels in the franchise. Having them all here together is a fantastic way to experience them. This entry features the arcade combo system of its predecessors and feels great to play. While the franchise got faster in this generation, 2X is a bit slower in comparison, but I think it's something you can quickly get comfortable with. Grinds, manuals, and air tricks all feel great and flow together perfectly. Reverts do not make an appearance in this entry, so seamless transitions from bowls to manuals don't really happen, but there are always ways to set up perfect combos. The game also includes exclusive levels only to the Xbox, but to be honest, they aren't the biggest showstoppers. It's the original levels that work exceptionally well here. The graphical upgrade is strong. The lighting is great, and the character models also look solid. If you love Tony Hawk games and haven't played this combo, it's like a greatest hits release, offering loads of fun. These games are endlessly replayable to me because learning these levels and perfectly navigating them is something that is perfected with time. In 2001, during Tony Hawk Fever, this would have been a must-buy for me at launch. 
It's a combination of two excellent games that would have offered loads of fun after buying it. Speaking of the Tony Hawk craze, we have another sports title trying the exact same formula. And this is the last game on today's list, and that's Trans World Surf. This ended up getting a PS2 and GameCube release years after its initial launch on Xbox. It's an arcade surfing game that has you rolling up to waves and completing level goals, which mostly consist of tricking on the waves. You can ride the tops of them, stun off the sides, or ride through the wave. It's an interesting game idea, and surfing in a game sounds like a lot of fun, even for someone who knows next to nothing about surfing. However, I do find the learning curve for this game to be a bit high. Tricking off waves requires a very specific moveset and way of moving around. It feels good gliding on the waves, but it never feels great actually pulling off the tricks. Getting air is not really satisfying and feels like an odd mix of realism and an arcade feel that I can never quite pin down. For the time, I will say the water and waves look excellent. The rendering on the waves and how they organically appear is amazing for the time of release. I just think the level design is automatically a little weak because there's just not enough variation in the locale since it's the ocean. The intensity of the waves swap, but I feel like no location quite stood out to me. This one has its fans though, and I get it, it's a neat idea. I'm sure if you sit for extremely long periods, you will finally get the game's movements down, but I just never liked the feeling of playing this one. Maybe one day I'll get into it if I really dig into it, but for now, it's not going to be for everyone. At launch, I don't think this was a standout choice, and if you wanted at launch an extreme sports title, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2X was the much better option. And that's it! Those were all 20 of the original Xbox games that launched with the console in North America. The lineup featured some amazing games like Project Gotham Racing, Halo, and Dead or Alive 3. However, I'm always interested in the games in the middle that don't get as much of the limelight. One thing to say about this lineup is that there was something for every type of gamer, from sports titles to racing, shooters, and platformers. You had something to pick up, and there's a lot of good stuff here. Sure, there's some stinkers, but overall you got a pretty solid game with many of these titles. I think launching with such a diverse lineup was a way for Xbox to showcase the support they had on the console, making it clear that every gamer was welcome. It was the start of a wonderful era, and it's nice to go back now and reminisce about the potential that started here. That wraps it up for today though, if you enjoyed this video be sure to leave a like, it helps me out a lot. Subscribe to keep up with the retro Xbox content. Also comment below with any Xbox memories, or maybe some opinions that you didn't agree with or that you agreed with. I think everybody's opinion is important, and I'd love to hear from you. And a huge thank you to my YouTube channel members, thank you so much for the support, and I'll see you here next time at Camp Xbox.